Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, uh, last stage of this uh, webinar for the uh, China Private Client. Um, going to be joined today by a number of speakers. But before we, we do the formal introduction to this virtual roundtable, uh, I'd like to uh, just run through a couple of the virtual roundtables that will be held later on in June. So obviously today is all concentrating on the China Private Client virtual roundtable. Later on in June, uh, we'll be also doing the Thai uh, Private Client round, virtual roundtable. Um, some of the parties involved are already listed, but we are also going to be inviting uh, Japanese legal counsel to, to join in this as part of the fact patterns uh, to, to be run through on that version. And then later still, we'll also be doing the Malaysia uh, Private Client Virtual Roundtable. And here we're hoping to be joined by Lab One IPFC, and of course, Henley Partners and myself, uh, Zach Lucas at, Hen at uh, McCarthy Denning. So these are some of the virtual roundtables that will be occurring probably in a couple of weeks into June. And uh, what will happen is we'll, we'll make the usual sort of a promotional rounds so that you're aware of the dates when they become uh, up for grabs. So for today's session, it's a lot like the previous virtual roundtables where we're going to be discussing the interaction of different um, uh, legislative regimes, so different jurisdiction regimes. Here we're looking at it from the China perspective, and we're really looking carefully at the interaction of jurisdictions from the standpoint of an international financial center. So we obviously have, from an international financial point, um, a lot of foreign clients, and we, we promote structures, we promote uh, trusts and companies, etc. And the idea behind these virtual round tables is to give us an opportunity to work out how the interaction between the laws will work, where clients go through life cycle events, so things like divorce, uh, death, etc. So that's the basis of these virtual round tables. It's a sincere effort on the part of the various speakers to bring their expertise to, to bear on what is a cross-border issue between typically the international clientele that we would be facing in ordinary practice. So with that, what I'll do is I'll ask Michael, um, Michael Shu from Tricor Trust to take us through um, this virtual round table. And uh, Michael, if you could start your uh, screen share. Thank you, uh, Zach, and um, welcome everyone to our uh, round table. Um, I'll just bring up the slide and put it into full screen. Okay. If you just run it, yeah. Okay. There you go. Right, there we go. So, uh, first of all, I would like to um, introduce the panel of speakers. Um, I'll start off with uh, Dr. Li Fang Gong. Um, Dr. Gong is a senior partner of uh, Jung Lung's offices in Shanghai in China. Uh, he has more than 20 years of legal experience advising both international as well as uh, mainland Chinese clients on wealth planning, uh, asset protection, and as well as um, advising on cross-border structures. Dr. Gong also advises on transactional, inbound and outbound um, mergers and acquisitions, private equity, as well as joint ventures. He is head of the firm's research institute and private equity practice. Uh, Dr. Gong has also been recognized by Chambers and Legal 500 as a leading individual lawyer for many, many years. And more recently, he's been recognized as uh, an M&A Lawyer of the Year uh, in 2019 by Finance Monthly. Uh, then we have Zach, uh, Zach Lucas, a partner at MacArthur Denning. Uh, Zach is a UK qualified lawyer with over 20 years international and private client experience, advising high net worth individuals and families in relation to in international wills, trusts, estates with particular expertise advising on cross-border succession and international matrimonial rights and remedies. Zach currently splits his time between London and Singapore, and uh, it's a leading, uh, the leading firm's partnership with local Singapore law firm Arrowgates uh, LLC. Zach is a former partner of various international law firms and was previously admitted to practice in the BVI and Anguilla. Uh, 
Uh, we're also uh, very, very privileged to have uh, John Shoemaker joining us as well. John is a registered foreign uh, lawyer from law firm Butler Snow. He has over 25 years experience uh, that includes US tax and regulatory law, uh, multi-jurisdictional compliance issues globally. Uh, John is a seasoned professional in international wealth transfer planning. He represents high, ultra high net worth families and family controlled businesses throughout the world with respect to US federal income tax, uh, gift tax and estate tax issues especially as they apply to trusts, uh, foundations, and other fiduciary structures. He's a frequent presenter on cross-border US tax issues. His extensive understanding of US estates, succession, and related community property laws, combined with a background in regulatory issues of compliance and management, gives him a unique insight into managing and controlling risk and structuring fiduciary products in a highly efficient and compliant manner. Um, we also uh, would very much like to welcome Jennifer, Jennifer Lai, Managing Partner of, and Head of North Asia of Hemian Partners. Um, Jennifer is a Managing Partner and Head of North Asia at Hemian Partners. She's responsible for the development of North Asia region, including China, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and Macau. Jennifer and her team are well-known experts in the investment migration industry formulating strategies and providing residence and citizenship planning to high net worth individuals and families and related advisory services. Jennifer is a regular speaker at various international conferences on fam family wealth planning, offshore investments, residence and citizenship planning. And with a global market insights and many years of experience in Asia, Jennifer has developed a business acumen that's greatly valued by her team and clients. Uh, Jennifer is also a member of the Investment Migration Council um, and the Pacific Basin Economic Council. So um, I would like to welcome all the speakers and um, we'll now kick off uh, on the, our discussion. So today's agenda, uh, we'll have a uh, first case study talking about domestic China divorce, succession and community property. Our second case study will talk about uh, foreign divorce, succession and community property. And then our third case study, EU immigration, the applicable programs and the various implications. So with our first uh, case study, uh, we've got a situation here where we have um, two Chinese citizens, uh, husband and wife. Uh, we've got um, Li Wei and we've got Yin. And uh, they are both citizens and domiciled resident in China. And there are assets owned uh, by Li Wei, a uh, trading company that um, has, uh, is 30% owned by another company. Uh, he also holds banking uh, or land and buildings, basically real estate, and also uh, other investments here, a, a depository account or investment account. And then uh, he also has a um, trust in Hong Kong that holds 100% um, Hong Kong company that through a WUFI, uh, which uh, many of you will be familiar with um, in China, that then holds the 30% uh, of the trading company in China. Um, in addition, in Hong Kong, uh, the trust holds a trading company and uh, there's also a, um, uh, a management investment company and also uh, land and buildings in the US as well too. So we basically have assets in China and Hong Kong um, through a trust and uh, assets in the US. Uh, the couple have uh, two children, Tao, who is uh, domiciled and uh, resident in Singapore, uh, but holds a Chinese passport and is a Chinese citizen. Uh, also, another, a daughter, Wing Ling, who is a US citizen, domiciled and resident in the US. So uh, we'll talk about domestic community property um, with based on the full set of facts that um, 
we have just uh, set out. So in terms of um, community property law, we've got all, we've got the situation, we've got all these facts. And um, the questions that we have is firstly, the basis of, uh, what is the basis of Chinese community property rules? Uh, secondly, does Chinese community property law apply to inherited property or property acquired before marriage? And uh, pre and post nuptial agreements legally effective? So um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Gong to uh, kick off the session talking about the uh, Chinese community property law issues. So uh, Dr. Gong. So Frank, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Frank? Issue here. Yeah, one second. Let me see. Thing we can do is um, scroll onwards. We'll come back when um, Frank gets a chance to to join us again. I think he's he's trying to dial in, but I think if you scroll on, okay, uh, Michael, we can. Probably pick up the the foreign fact pattern first. Okay, um, and then uh, we're also talking about the um, trust indirect shareholding in the Chinese trading company. So we'll wait till Frank comes back online so that he can um, address these issues. But moving on, um, we have some other questions. Uh, firstly, would the U.S. recognise a foreign community property or Chinese community property ownership? Uh, so perhaps uh, we'll let John uh, talk about this point. Sure. Thanks, Michael. Um, I think an important thing to, to recognize or understand from a U.S. perspective, absent a contention, um, the concept of community property and some type of mandatorily shared interest between spouses is um, recognized in the United States. A little different than I think what Frank will cover. It's a state by state basis. So we have a federal taxation system. Sitting below that is a state taxation system. But from community property, or as we'll talk about later in the slide, succession planning perspective, um, those are typically regulated at a state level. So the answer here is yes, the US um, could recognize that ownership or assignment absent a contention, but that there could be a contention raised on behalf of some member of the family, depending upon where the property is located and which state's rules might differ from the conclusions that are reached in the offshore jurisdiction. There'll be slight differences between movable and immovable property. So for the example we have here, the company shares or other types of bankable um, or, or movable property assets, maybe not as likely to enforce the US rules under um, a contention, but with the landed building, the immovable property, highly likely that there could be a challenge raised under the differing rule in the state jurisdiction. So something to think ahead about, and hopefully there is um, either a, a prenuptial agreement or as we'll talk to, as we'll talk about coming up in the succession planning side of things, um, maybe a will to uh, uh, steer clear of the clash of rules that could arise with different jurisdictions. And John, just, just on that, is it the right that the US would look at the matrimonial domicile of the parties? And here, they, clearly the matrimonial domicile is China and they would be sympathetic to the community rights that's established in China in recognition in the US, is that right? I, I would say there is a, a partial deference. So from a recognition of marriage perspective, absolutely. The US, both at the federal and the state level, has the concept of defining marriage 
as it is defined in the jurisdiction in which the couple are domiciled or resident. So there would be a respect for the fact that there was a marriage. It tends to flow logically that then you give some deference to the laws governing that, but we're adding the complication here of a second residence of the property that's um, perhaps in contention if there's a challenge raised. So I think in general, you're correct, uh, but we need to be careful that there is a bit of a stronger um, problem that might need to be resolved because those states where the property is located could have conflicting views on how the property is supposed to uh, be divided. Right. And I think, Mike, if you go back one to the Hong Kong Trust. Certainly. So here, what we're looking at is, uh, from a Hong Kong perspective, um, would there be a recognition of community rights? And would effectively Hong Kong trust law provide protections against that community right? Um, but perhaps later on, Frank, when he joins us again, can talk about the issue when it's in terms of the assets uh, or the shares held in China. But from a Hong Kong perspective, there is no firewall protection against a community claim on the trust. And in fact, all of the international financial centers have not sought to uh, effectively override community property rights when it comes to their firewall protections against forced airship or against matrimonial sort of discretionary court orders. So from a community right, um, as long as Hong Kong is satisfied that the matrimonial domicile is China and it confers uh, these sorts of rights to assets that were placed into trust, in other words, the community rights when the assets were transferred into trust, uh, there's no Hong Kong law that will bar that proprietary right being traced into the trust. So the point of that is Hong Kong does have protections, but like a lot of the other international, international financial centers, it doesn't seek to protect against community rights because in effect, a community right is a proprietary right. It's not by succession law. It's actually something that you would own by virtue of the marriage. And in this case, uh, Hong Kong applying common law principles would look to the matrimonial domicile. And if that provides community, then it would also recognize that insofar as assets that were transferred into trust were cloaked with a community right to them. So that's an important consideration when you're creating trusts, because if you do have a couple from, let's say, a civil law jurisdiction or a jurisdiction that recognizes community, you would effectively need to go through a procedure of at least having the, 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 the spouse that's not contributing the assets consenting to the contribution of the asset by one of the spouses, because what you're looking at is jointly held property effectively. Yes, that's right, um, Zach, and I think that um, the recent Otto Poon case um, is perhaps a case in point as well, too, because that was where um, a married couple uh, with a husband settled illicit company shares into a trust during the marriage, um, where the beneficiaries were the husband, wife, and the daughter. And mm. when the couple divorced, uh, the wife tried to claim or claw back out half of the interest in the trust. Um, whereas the husband tried to argue that no, uh, the, the trust was really for three beneficiaries and she should only get a half of the two thirds, not the daughter's share. But um, in that particular case, the court um, accepted the wife's claim that she should be entitled to half of the total uh, of the assets that were settled into the trust during the marriage. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's correct. That's correct. Well, let's okay. move, up, uh, move on in the interest of time. I'm not sure whether. Z uh, Frank is back online or not yet? Yeah, uh, I'm back. Oh, you're okay, back. Great, yeah. great. Um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go, Frank. I'll go back through the questions again. Um, so the first one was: Can Yin claim community property rights to uh, property transferred into a trust? Next one is: you does, Go back. I think go back more. to the original there. Yeah. So this, I think, yeah. Okay. I think these were yes. That's These it. are all the questions. So the basis of Chinese community property rule, uh, property rules, uh, whether community Chinese community property law would apply to inherited property uh, or property acquired before a marriage, um, and also whether pre and post nuptial agreements are legally effective and recognised. So uh, perhaps if you can um, make your comments, Frank. Yeah, so basically for the uh, China community property rules, so for the, all the assets acquired during a marriage, unless there's an agreement, uh, like a prenuptial or postnuptial agreement, uh, 
uh, stating otherwise, uh, they will be owned jointly uh, by the couple. Uh, and uh, the community rule apply to uh, inherited property unless otherwise stated in the will or the gift agreement. Uh, but for the property acquired before marriage, uh, the rule of thumb is it shall belong to the person that acquired the uh, assets, uh, uh, but not treated as community property. And for the third question, uh, for pre or post nuptial agreement, uh, generally speaking, they will be uh, legally effective. They will be treated as legally binding. Uh, unless, you know, for instance, they never entered into marriage, unless it was uh, uh, entered into uh, the agreement uh, under a force. Uh, uh, so, but generally speaking, it will be considered as binding and effective. And does it make a difference that you can have a post-nuptial agreement? So after the celebration of the marriage, is there, is there any difference or it's basically the same principles being applied? Uh, it's basically the same principle. And when you do these nuptial agreements, do you have to go to a notary or does the court have to endorse it? Is there a particular formula, sort of formalities that you need to go through to make them effective? Uh, yeah, unlike, uh, let's say the rules in the US, there's a particular procedure. Um, generally speaking in China, there's a, no particular formality. It must be in writing though. Right, okay. Okay, I think Michael, we could probably go on past the, the questions that we've already answered. Right, so uh, the next one, Frank, is uh, whether Yin can claim community property rights to property transferred into a trust, and in this particular case, a Hong Kong trust, um, and also whether Hong Kong trust law provides protections against Chinese community property claim. Mm -hmm. And um, what about the trust's indirect shareholding of the 30% in the Chinese trading company? So in this case, the trust holds a Hong Kong company, which holds um, probably a, possibly a woofy uh, that then holds 30% of assets that are actually situated in China. All right. So for the first question, can Ying claim community rights to property transfer to a foreign trust? Now, if the action, the lawsuit is initiated in China, the PRC court will not, uh, generally speaking, will not entertain such kind of claim, uh, largely due to the fact that uh, the property or the assets are owned or, or, or located overseas. Uh, the PRC court, generally speaking, they will not go beyond their jurisdiction to rule uh, to make rulings over assets outside of China. Uh, and uh, for the question number two, does Hong Kong trust law provide protections against yeah. the community property Don't claim? worry about that one, Frank. Don't worry about that one. I think it's the okay. one with the, 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 the ownership of the China trading company because there, that that is within the, the jurisdiction of China. Yes, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Now, uh, the PRC court, they, they, they will treat the trading company as owned by uh, its parent, uh, not treated as if it was owned by the ultimate shareholders. Right. So that's why they were generally speaking, they will respect uh, the current shareholding structure and will not break it down and by uh, declaring that the assets, uh, because of the ultimate ownership alleged uh, by the other spouse, uh, they will just uh, entertain such claim uh, by uh, asserting, helping, but by allowing the spouse to assert rights over the assets uh, located in China under such structure. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Frank. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll move on in the interest of time. Um, the, these ones we've covered um, already with uh, John when, when you were offline, Frank, so we'll move on. So the next um, area is, 
concerning domestic divorce. So um, these are the facts that we have. We've got um, uh, Li Wei and Yin. Um, they're both Chinese citizens, domiciled and resident in China. Um, again, based on the previous facts that we had, uh, they have a uh, son, Tao, in Singapore and a daughter, Wing, uh, Wen Ling, living in the US. And they have the assets that we stated before as well. So these are all the same as before, both in China, um, the assets held by the trust in Hong Kong, um, and also the assets in the US. So in a divorce situation, uh, we have here um, Li Wei and Yin um, deciding to, that they will get divorced. So the first question we have is, um, what is the basis on which a Chinese court would exercise jurisdiction regarding the divorce? Uh, secondly, would a Chinese court seek to redistribute or alter the community uh, property rights? And then would a Chinese court follow and enforce the terms of a pre or post nuptial agreement? Uh, so I'll hand over to you, Frank. All right. So for the basis on which China court will exercise jurisdiction to grant divorce, uh, there are many factors uh, that can be used for uh, allowing such kind of jurisdiction. For instance, uh, if they are both PRC citizens, um, if one party is a PRC citizen, or if one party is uh, uh, domiciled in China, uh, so those can be all factors that are used, uh, that can be used in, uh, for uh, enabling or allowing a court jurisdiction in China. Uh, the second question is, would a China court seek to redistribute or alter uh, community property rights? Um, if both couple, uh, they are uh, PRC nationals, uh, so then uh, it's unlikely that they will change, um, they, will, they will not alter the community property rights, you know, unless, unless both parties have been uh, domiciled outside of China. Uh, and then in such case, the court might decide to use either uh, a, a, the law that uh, chosen by agreement by both uh, couple uh, by both parties or if they do not agree to choose a particular law to govern then uh, the law of a domicile uh, will will apply uh, then we will look at the, the governing law to decide whether the community property rights uh, will will be altered uh, and number three, would a China court follow and enforce the terms of uh, a nuptial agreement? Uh, yeah, it has been covered earlier. Uh, generally speaking, the China court, as long as it's binding, it's effective, uh, they will fo follow and enforce the terms of a nuptial agreement. Thank you, Frank. Mm -hmm. um, and some more questions. Would a Chinese divorce court seek to make an order um, terminating the um, Hong Kong Trust, uh, whether the Hong Kong law provides any firewall defense, and would a Chinese divorce court seek to make an order against the trust's indirect shares in the Chinese trading company? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the first question, would a China divorce court seek to make an order varying or terminating the Hong Kong Trust? Uh, it's unlikely. Uh, the, uh, as I said before, uh, the PRC court they will not uh, usually make any ruling over assets outside of China. Uh, so they will very uh, unlikely to uh, seek to make an order uh, trying to inv invalidate a Hong Kong trust. Uh, so you basically, if you want to challenge or, or invalidate a Hong Kong trust, then you will have to go to a Hong Kong court rather yeah, than... I, I would agree with that, Frank. Um, I think that would be a case of um, uh, the couple uh, who's trying to claim an interest or, or claw back a share from the trust. Um, they would need to do that in a Hong Kong court uh, under Hong Kong's jurisdiction. 
Uh, yeah. I quite agree with but that. From mm -hmm. Hong Kong perspective, there's no express firewall protection against a, a divorce court order in that sense, if it were a discretionary order being made. But in the same way, it would have to rely very heavily on Hong Kong courts exercising committee to actually allow for a trust to be um, in sort of uh, varied in that way. And, and I think a case would be maybe the behavior of one of the spouses in creating the trust was deliberately to frustrate the uh, China divorce court. That might be an instance in which a Hong Kong court may look sympathetically at a, uh, at a claim across, but there's no express provision in the Hong Kong trustee ordinance to protect against a foreign court order seeking to vary a trust. But that doesn't mean necessarily that they would naturally follow that court order. It would be down to a matter of comity in the, uh, in the, in the, in the relevant proceedings. Yep. Yeah, I agree with that uh, comment, uh, Zach. I think the only, in fact, I doubt whether there are many trust jurisdictions that actually specifically or expressly um, say that they will not recognise um, you know, any overseas um, matrimonial claims. I, my understanding, um, uh, to my knowledge, is that the only jurisdiction that does do that is the uh, in Samoa, under Samoan trust law, uh, the statutes expressly state that um, a Samoan trust will not recognise um, any matrimonial, foreign matrimonial claim. But apart from Samoa, I don't believe that there are any other jurisdictions that yeah. have I mean, the, uh, trust the general one, Yeah, it's, it's the distinction. It's the distinction between the community property, which is proprietary, and then these discretionary court orders varying the rights. And I think it's this discretionary. You, you'll look at jurisdictions like Jersey and Guernsey, where they've been pretty heavily beat up by the UK family courts in trying to vary and, and make their trusts shams, et cetera. There they have very, very strong protections against those sorts of orders, but they're not community-based orders. They're mm. mostly against discretionary um, uh, orders being made by the family division. But that's, that's mostly where the protection is. And that's uh, in Hong Kong, we haven't enacted that type of protection um, that you'd see in places like Gibraltar, for instance, as a modern race. Yes, and no, I don't. I don't believe that there's been any test cases um, so far. Yeah. Um, so it, it's still a very grey area at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, shall we? Uh, so I think we covered those uh, first two questions. So Frank, uh, would you like to um, talk about yeah. the third question? Yeah. For the third question, uh, would a China divorce court seek to make an order against the trust indirect shares in the China trading company? Uh, the answer is no. Um, you know, unless uh, I, I think in a, in the rare cases, if the spouse can um, have enough evidence to show that originally the shares were transferred in a in an illegal way uh, into the offshore structure, mm -hmm. and then it may be a possibility that uh, they can charge in the PRC. Uh, challenge it in the PRC court uh, and trying to claim uh, the shares in the in the Chinese domestic company. Uh, otherwise, generally speaking, uh, they, they cannot do that. Okay. Well, um, that's nice to hear from a trustee's perspective, uh, Frank. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on, um, we've got uh, these facts again. And uh, another question is, would a Chinese divorce court seek to make an order against foreign property. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps we'll cover that question first. Um, so we yeah, the answer is no. Um, generally speaking, they do not, Chinese courts, they do not, um, they are not willing to make any court rulings mm -hmm. uh, over assets outside of China. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Mm -hmm. um, then moving on to domestic succession. So we have a situation here where um, we've got the set of facts that we had previously. Um, and in this situation, we have Li Wei who uh, passes away. He, he dies. So the first question we have here is, what is the basis and application of uh, Chinese succession laws? Secondly, whether China uh, or does China succession law include forced airship rights? And then is it possible to agree to vary inheritance rights? 
And then finally, does China succession law allow uh, any testamentary freedom? So again, uh, we'll call on you, Frank, to um, answer these questions. All right. Uh, sure. Uh, for the first question, uh, in terms of application of PRC law, uh, there are two uh, factors here. Number one is a domicile of the deceased. Uh, so if uh, Li Wei uh, domicile is, uh, is China, then the PRC law will uh, apply. Uh, then another factor is uh, if he, even if he his domicile is in, let's say, in the U.S. or, or somewhere else, uh, but he's got real estate in China. Then uh, the governing law with respect to uh, those uh, such real estate uh, uh, could be the PRC law. Uh, then number two, does China succession law include forced air rights? Uh, yes. Uh, so the PRC law provides that if um, you fail to leave enough assets for uh, any of the heir that uh, do not have source of income and they do not have uh, the work capacity. You know, for instance, they are uh, children. Uh, they, can, they, they don't have the capability to work uh, and they do not have source of income or they are disabled, they, they, they cannot work uh, and if they do not have source of income. So the, the, the law provides that you must leave uh, estate uh, for, for such heir. Uh, and also such rights uh, include fetus. So the, the, the fetus in the womb. Uh, so you must leave shares for them. Okay. Yeah, and uh, number three, is it possible to agree to vary uh, inheritance rights? Yeah, so uh, the typical way of doing it by a will uh, and slash or a gift agreement. So you can give it, you can uh, leave uh, all your assets to somebody uh, either as your heir or your friends. Uh, Provided that you do not violate the rule for the forced air rights. Frank, on that forced air right, is there a percentage specified that if you do have disabled children or underage children, is there a percentage that the, the law provides that you need to, to leave or, or is it left open to the parties to agree? Yeah, actually, no. Uh, there's no particular threshold or um, percentage uh, that, that is provided under the law. So it all depends on the case. It's within the uh, discretion of the, of the judge. Okay. But uh, otherwise, there's just full testamentary freedom, except for this one area of looking at uh, effectively dependence, disabled dependence or underage dependents, you have, you can't disinherit them. Um, you have to provide for them. That's correct, is it? Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. So I guess that answers the five, the, yeah. the fourth yeah. question as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have some more questions um, in this situation. Uh, the first one is, does China succession law um, permit or allow heirs to claw back um, assets that have been transferred into a foreign trust? And then does Hong Kong trust law provide protection against an inheritance or succession clawback claim um, in the China? And also what happens to the indirect shares of the 30% in that company that's held by a trust in um, a Chinese trading company? Uh, well, for the first question, um, you know, we haven't had any uh, cases or precedents uh, in court with respect to uh, clawing back from uh, assets from trust, uh, not even domestic trust, uh, not to mention foreign trust. So we don't have uh, rules or precedents uh, regarding this, uh, but 
based on the practice, we know it will be very rare for a PRC court to make a ruling uh, like this. Uh, for one thing is they don't want to make any rulings re uh, over assets or trust outside of China. Uh, number two, uh, for the concept of clawing back, uh, it's, uh, again, it's unprecedented. So uh, we will have to look at the uh, case uh, and uh, it will be determined by court uh, on a case by case uh, basis. So the second question is about Hong Kong law, right? So that, that's something I would love to learn, uh, maybe uh, Sam. Yeah. I mean, the clawback from a Hong Kong perspective, Hong Kong and Singapore um, have similar provisions on this. They're not identical. So the Hong Kong provision is a bit more modernized than the Singapore version, but it would basically seek to, um, to resist and protect the trust from inheritance and succession claims in this way. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't have a good airing in, uh, in Hong Kong uh, on that basis, even if the court were to make a, you know, exceptional clawback claim, it wouldn't be successful in Hong Kong, uh, generally speaking, because they have these anti-forced airship uh, protections against the trust being attacked. Yes, and I think that um, it, it may not necessarily be based on Chinese succession law. Um, it's more likely to be, uh, depending on whether or not the family members are beneficiaries of the Hong Kong Trust. So, um, if, for example, if the children are beneficiaries of the Hong Kong Trust, then their claim from the Trust is more likely to be as beneficiaries of the Trust rather than through their rights uh, under, under Chinese mm -hmm. succession law, I, I think. Okay, and um, Frank, have we covered the, um, oh, the Chinese company in China? Yeah, for the third question, I think the answer is no as well. If, if the trading company is owned by a trust, now if the trading company is, is owned directly by the deceased, then that would be a different story. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so some more questions in relation to this situation where uh, Li Wei has, has passed away. Uh, the first one is uh, which succession law would apply to the um, US company and US assets? Um, which succession law will apply to the US real estate, uh, Chinese or American? And is there any state uh, and or federal estate tax implications from a US perspective? So I think we'll be looking to you, John, uh, to answer some of these questions. Yeah, I'll start. Um, I think the, the answer, as I briefly mentioned um, a little earlier, it's gonna be a state by state determination and we're gonna look at where the, the shares are, are, are located. Um, potentially you're looking at where the company that's doing business that issuing the share is, if there is a contention. And contention really is at the heart of what we're analyzing here. Is there a conflict in the way that that state's law is treating the succession of those shares versus the way that China would? Or is there a member of the family that's raising an issue uh, and challenging it. Absent that, there, I would say, more likely um, would be a deferral um, uh, approach taken with the, with the shares as movable property from a U.S. perspective. Now, you move over to the land, I think the, the presumption shifts a bit more towards, you know, immo immovable property, probably the U.S. succession law, um, unless there is uh, a conflict there that somehow has a facts and circumstances that would resolve itself in favor of um, uh, in favor of the determination that was made under uh, Chinese law, which there may not have been if I understood Frank's approach um, uh, about trying to enforce an order on overseas property. On the last point about state or federal estate tax implications, the answer there is yes, there can be. And I think this is something a lot of folks don't realize or understand. They think of U.S. estate tax as applying to U.S. persons or people domiciled in the U.S. That's not fully true. Uh, it's not the only application. Um, U.S. estate tax applies to U.S. CITES assets, and that would include these company shares and the land. Um, there's a very small exemption for non-US persons that would be exposed to this, only 60,000 US dollars. Anything above that, subject to a 40% US estate tax. That's the bad news. 
The good news is with some uh, proper planning ahead of time, you can um, effectively block the imposition of that by holding these assets, not directly in the name of a non-US person, but through a properly established and run offshore company. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention that connects to the succession law along that same point of planning, any type of, of different treatment under the law we would hope would have been handled with good planning ahead of time. Um, uh, you know, I know uh, um, Dr. Gong's firm and my firm often work together with clients like Li Wei who will think ahead, okay, here's how I want this to pass and do the proper will and testamentary planning. That allows counsel from the US and China to think ahead about potential conflicts and try to resolve those through, through testamentary power to the full extent possible. That's very good. Thanks, John. I was actually going to just ask you that question, whether a, um, a will in the US may help um, to clarify the position. So thank you very much for that. Um, now, the next case study, and we better move this along because I think we could be running short of time. Um, we have uh, Henry, and he is US resident. Uh, he is uh, a Chinese citizen, but domiciled in the US. So he holds, uh, he retains his Chinese passport. He has um, two children. Uh, he has a wife, Lin, and uh, a daughter, Shan. And he has a uh, trading company and real estate uh, in the US. He also has assets in China. So he's got land and buildings, um, a trading company in China, and they also have a son living in China, Chang. They also have a Singapore trust, or he has a Singapore trust, which holds a depository account, an investment account. And there is also a company and a depository account um, under a, a Cayman uh, company. So we'll look at foreign community property. And with the situation um, between Henry and Lynn, what is the community property rights? So what is the basis of community property rights in the US? What's the application to inherited and um, premarital property? And were the pre and post nuptial agreements are legally valid? So uh, John, uh, can you please address these questions? I can, and I can be succinct. Unfortunately, it's not the kind of succinctness that I think that people will like, which is this is every lawyer's favorite answer. It depends. Um, each state uh, has its own definition of marital property, and that definition, they can vary widely in the U.S. A state like California that is perceived as being more progressive might have um, a more equitable community property approach to sharing of property, both that's brought into the marriage and that's um, acquired during the marriage. Whereas a state that comes from a more conservative perspective, say like a Texas or a Florida might have uh, a much different definition. So the answer to this question is really gonna um, depend upon what state has jurisdiction over that relationship. Um, and that can vary uh, also with the definitions applied um, if they've lived there for a short period, as short as say like eight weeks, some jurisdictions might adopt that as their um, uh, residency um, rules taking effect. Others might have a longer period of time before you trigger um, the, the marriage being in that location and their community property and definition of marital property to apply. Um, like I mentioned, inherited and pre-marriage property, it can be covered in some progressive states like uh, California and, and potentially not covered in other states. And then from a pre and post nuptial agreement perspective, they are valid in the US. We tend to want to see four rules of thumb followed with them though. So each party should have their own counsel, not using the same counsel to look at the document. Um, we want to see full declaration of assets, openness. If one party is shielding off some asset that they're bringing into the marriage, that can be a strong factor in invalidating the, the agreement 
either a pre or a post nuptial um, agreement. The agreement should not concern custody issues or duties during the marriage. So it shouldn't say this kid will go with this person or this person has duties to raise children or do certain household um, uh, responsibilities. Those are not proper things to discuss or, or have be valid in a pre or post nuptial agreement. And then lastly, and this is just for pre prenuptial agreements, obviously, we want to see it a, a good five to six weeks ahead of the marriage. So not something done in haste a couple days before or the day of the wedding. I think there'd be a presumption that that was um, under duress or not properly executed. Thank you, John. So moving on, the next question is, would a foreign community property ownership be recognized in China? And uh, this question, perhaps, uh, Frank. Uh, yeah, so first of all, uh, it really depends on the application of which law. So if, uh, if the PRC law applies, uh, even if those uh, uh, the couples are non-PRC nationals, uh, for instance, those, uh, the couple lives in China, the domicile, their domicile is in China, then the likelihood uh, of applying PRC law uh, is pretty high. And then uh, likely the PRC court will apply uh, the PRC community property rule uh, for, for, for the couple. However, even if the, the, let's say the, uh, we have a case in Shanghai a few years back, it's a Hong Kong couple uh, with Hong Kong passports. So they have assets to uh, have dispute uh, after divorce uh, located in Shanghai. So the Shanghai court decide to apply uh, the Hong Kong law uh, in adjudicating uh, that dispute uh, for the reason that uh, those, uh, the couple, they are uh, both domiciled in Hong Kong with Hong Kong uh, passports. So uh, it really depends on uh, the couple's domicile. And uh, uh, if the domicile are not in China, then they will apply uh, the, uh, the law of that jurisdiction uh, for, for the domicile. So Frank, uh, applying that principle in this situation, because um, Henry and Lynn uh, live in the US and domiciled in the US, uh, so in respect of the Chinese property, the real estate and the uh, company, um, presumably the court would follow the same principle and uh, look at uh, the US uh, matrimonial law and divorce law. Yeah, which, which happened to be very uh, similar to, uh, to China as well, because they, they also have the same uh, community property rule. Uh, is that right, John? It can be. Again, it goes, comes back to which state is applying it. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. okay. Um, thanks, gentlemen. We'll move on to the next question. Um, would foreign community property ownership be recognized and enforceable against the Singapore Trust? Uh, and would foreign company, uh, community uh, ownership be recognized and enforceable against the Cayman Company shares? Uh, yeah. So, Zach. Yeah, I can do this fairly quickly. As we mentioned before, uh, Singapore wouldn't apply a lot like um, Hong Kong, wouldn't provide, doesn't provide any firewall protection against the matrimonial uh, regime that applies. So what would happen is there would be a claim by effectively, let's say, Lin in this case, that assets put into the trust were community assets under US law and therefore were not fully disposed of by Henry. And uh, Singapore law doesn't provide protections against that. It would be uh, effectively a, a claim made in Singapore on a proprietary basis. And in fact, no jurisdiction has tried to block that type of um, claim because effectively the ownership, the matrimonial domicile has decided that that was jointly held assets and that Singapore applying common law principles would follow. And the same thing in the Cayman Islands, um, applying common law principles again, they would look to the matrimonial uh, domicile, they'd look at the uh, sort of effective community rights there and then they would transpose it to the foreign held asset, this, in this case, movable assets in the, in the shape of the Cayman Island shares. So, Again, Cayman would be expected to follow that. Thanks, Zach. Okay, now we're moving on to foreign divorce. Um, 
And in this case, we have uh, Henry and Lynn, where they are living in the US, they're resident and domiciled in the US, but they still hold their Chinese passports, still Chinese citizens. Um, similar situation with the son and daughter, a daughter in the US, son in China, real um, assets in China, uh, in the US, and the Singapore Trust and the Cayman Company. Um, the next question is, what is the basis in, in which the, um, on which the US court would exercise its jurisdiction in divorce proceedings? Would a US divorce court seek to redistribute or distribute or alter the community property rights? And whether pre and post nuptial agreements are legally effective? Uh, so John. Yeah, so it's again state by state. It's typically a domicile slash residence test to see where the couple is at the time of the divorce proceedings. Um, sometimes you can see one spouse go to a different jurisdiction to try to get um, jurisdiction in another state. The states tend to not like short-term residents because they don't want to be seen as divorce mill states, uh, but it's going to be on a state-by-state -state basis for claiming jurisdiction about around residents. Would they seek to redistribute or alter community property rights? Um, typically, no. Um, the the no-fault versus fault concept in the U.S. is really geared towards no-fault. The idea of you don't have to prove something, you don't have to have a contentious issue, and along with that has been the the concept of let's just follow the rules and 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 spread things out the way that the law has said in the definition of marital property in that state. Now, remember that can vary widely though. It's not one federal definition 50-50. It can, it can change from state to state what the assumption was both for property coming into the marriage and, and property acquired during the marriage. And then pre and post nuptial, nuptial agreements, I think we've already covered those. Just make sure those four elements are, um, are dealt with uh, so that you don't have an invalidated agreement during the divorce proceeding. Okay, thanks, John. Um, another question, whether U.S. divorce courts may order division of the uh, Chinese property and whether a U.S. court order would be recognized and enforceable in China. Uh, Frank. I think um, I'll start, just Frank, just to set the tone there on that, whether the U.S. court would, would, would enter that order. It, it is possible, um, uh, and, and, and actually, if, even in absence of contention, you might get an order saying, here's just the standard thing that everyone's agreed to, and then you take that and try to, try, try to enforce it. So, yes, it is possible, and it can happen that the U.S. court would issue that, um, and, and someone would take that to a Chinese court to enforce or Chinese authorities to enforce. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, yeah. For the for the second question, you know, if a court order in the U.S. has been issued, um, then um, in the PRC law, chances are they will not recognize and enforce it in China uh, unless there's a treaty. Uh, but uh, I don't think China and the U.S. has a treaty in terms of recognizing each other's court rulings. Thank you, Frank. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question is whether a U.S. court may order a variation of the Singapore Trust, uh, whether a U.S. court would um, uh, order, would court order would be recognized and enforceable in Singapore. Uh, so from a U.S. perspective, the concept of trust variance does, you know, it is there under the common law. I would say it's not as... Um, it's not done as often as you might see, say, in a UK court. Um, the, the, the point of entry from a US court perspective will often be a sham trust or invalidation of the trust rather than variation of the terms. Mm -hmm. So simply, if there's a, a point raised where there was never a trust to begin with, the court could take attention to that and shift property back to the ownership mm -hmm. prior to the funding of the structure. Variation is possible, but less common, I would say, than, than perhaps Zach could comment on from a UK perspective. So far as from the Singapore standpoint, there's no express firewall protection against a foreign court seeking to vary a Singapore trust in matrimonial proceedings. Um, but I, it would be a matter of comity, I think, from the Singapore court's perspective as to whether they would actually go ahead and enforce that. And we've seen some of that in, in the, uh, the Channel Islands, where notwithstanding some of these firewall protections, the courts will, as a matter of comity, go ahead and enforce a foreign order against a domestic trust. 
so it wouldn't be a matter of comedy. But even under Singapore domestic law, there isn't the concept of a sort of anti and post nuptial settlement under the Matrimonial Causes Act or the version there in the same way as I think they have in Hong Kong. So I think it would be a matter of comedy as to whether or not that would be recognized. Thanks, Zach. Um, and then also whether Cayman would recognize um, and or enforce a foreign matrimonial order. Yeah, I think the same thing. There would, there would have to be as a matter of comedy because these are non um, sort of uh, uh, liquidated or sort of liquidated damages or uh, cost type claims. So these are property reallocation claims. So again, it would be a comedy claim. But if uh, I think if Henry, let's say, is the, the, the individual owning the shares, if he's still in the jurisdiction of the US courts, then presumably, and John can hopefully back me up on this, if um, Henry is still in the US jurisdiction, they would just simply order him to transfer the shares upon pain of being in contempt of court. Correct. So they, yeah. Right. OK, thanks. And uh, we're running um, late, so I'll keep moving on. Um, foreign succession is the next area that we will cover. Um, in this particular situation, we've got um, Henry, who has died. He's uh, a US resident, um, domiciled in the US, but a Chinese citizen, uh, married to Lynn, and similar situation to previously, same set of facts. The questions we have here, uh, what is the basis of uh, application of US succession law? Uh, is it domicile, situs, nationality, or residence? Um, which succession law will apply to US company shares and land, uh, the US or China? And whether US succession law contains forced airship provisions? So, uh, John. Yeah, so state by state from a succession, succession. law Just perspective. Question John, yeah, yeah, state by state from a succession law perspective. Don't confuse that with the estate tax issues that I mentioned earlier. There can be a federal definition of domicile. Um, all U.S. citizens are considered to be domiciled in the U.S. regardless of their physical location. So like myself, a U.S. citizen living in Singapore, if I pass away, I'm considered domiciled in the U.S. for federal estate tax purposes, not necessarily for succession law purposes in a particular state. Um, the U.S. company shares in land, similar to what I mentioned before, we're looking at where they're located, movable versus immovable property, but we've added another element to the equation that's going to tip it towards a particular state, and that's the residence of Henry at the time that he passes. And then forced airship, the U.S. doesn't have forced airship rules the way that we think of them outside the, the, the U.S. Um, there's one state, Louisiana, that has a civil law background, not a common law background, but they, in the 80s, by statute, kind of elim eliminated the forced airship um, elements of their law. We do have statutory protections, but those tend to focus in on spouses only, not children or another issue, the way that forced airship rules outside the United States would work. Right. Thanks, John. Uh, another question, which succession law would apply to the Chinese property, uh, US or China? Um, and is it possible for forced air uh, rights to be asserted against the Chinese property? If it's all right with Dr. Gong, I'll start and Ian, he can pick up. Um, I, I think most likely we're looking at the U.S. law in this situation because we've got that combination domicile, a lot of assets in the U.S., and so we're, we're probably going to try to enforce those. But I think we could potentially run into a conflict of the domicile definition. As I said, the U.S. has an exclusionary one. They really don't care about what anybody else's is. And under the U.S. rules, you can't have multiple domiciles in that in that way. And so I suspect if Henry hasn't deregistered his household and his passport in China, that Dr. Gong may speak about how China law could potentially apply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Dr. Gong? Yeah, I think, again, you know, it's uh, 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 for movable assets, uh, then the domicile law will apply. And, but for the real estate, then the Piazzi law will apply. Mm -hmm. uh, so there will be, um, you know, as John mentioned earlier, there could be uh, uh, contention, there could be conflict of uh, both uh, the Piazzi law and US law in such kind of situations. So then we will have to look at the facts uh, more closely and, and make a determination. Right. Thank you, Frank. Uh, 
Um, another question, is it possible for Chinese uh, forced airship um, and clawback rights to be asserted against the Singapore Trust? And what, are, uh, what anti-forced airship uh, protections does Singapore Trust law provide? And is it possible that Chinese forced airship rights will be recognized and enforceable in Cayman? Uh, Zach? Uh, clawback, I think um, Dr. Long will say that generally uh, China forced air clawback rights wouldn't be asserted out, uh, outside of China, if I, if I remember correctly. So that would be an unlikely claim. If it were to be forwarded, notwithstanding lack of precedent, then Singapore has anti-forced airship protections under its trust law. So they, they would be defeated by those, those provisions. Obviously, you'd have to go through the detail of those, but broadly, that's how it would work. And with respect to the Cayman Islands, Cayman would, would look at what they view as the domicile of Henry at death, and they'd make a determination. And I think in the fact pattern here, uh, Cayman would probably determine that um, Henry had died domiciled in the US, and therefore they wouldn't look to China law for the, uh, the for effectively the essential validity of who's entitled to those shares. So they would look to the US law, so they wouldn't look to China. Right. Thank you, Zach. Um, okay, we'll, we'll get on to case number three now, and we're running very uh, running over time now, uh, but we'll plow on. Um, in this particular case, we have um, uh, Chinese citizens domiciled in China. Uh, we have Chen and Jin, uh, who are married, and they have a son, Bolin. They have assets in China, um, and they are looking at uh, the couple, uh, Chen and Jin, are looking at immigrating um, to Europe, um, and then also acquiring European assets. So that's a situation that we have. And uh, we'll now ask Jennifer to um, consider these set, set of facts. And um, talking about popular European programs, the processes um, that apply, um, investment amounts, uh, AML and due diligence processes. So I'll hand over to Jennifer now. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, gentlemen. Um, so we're looking at this case study. So this couple is looking for the uh, European programs. Currently, um, specifically in the uh, China or in the regions that are where I oversee, the popular European programs would be a lot uh, for the high net worth families and the ultra high net worth families would be Malta, Cyprus. Um, because the benefit of uh, getting the um, Cyprus or the Malta um, citizenship program is because first uh, either no physical residence requirements or minimal, very minimal physical um, requirements, and then first they, and then they are the EU members that allow them to have the right of establishment in 27 EU uh, countries where they can work, they can um, go to school, and they, they can domicile there. Uh, without applying additional visas. I think that's a, a lot of benefits there. And of course that offer, I mean, getting the um, citizenship of these two countries also offer them a global mobility to over 170 and 180 countries. If you look at Malta, basically now they offer um, the visa free to the US, which is one of the uh, options now that only has Malta offering the US. I think that's very attractive to to the high net worth families, or the high net worth families. Um, in, in terms of the uh, process to apply, um, Malta actually, um, so Henley and Partners awarded by the government as a global uh, um, concession uh, to design and uh, promote the program of Malta Individual Investor Program in 2013. The program launched in 2014 with a quota of 1,800. And so far, closely about 70% are being approved, so roughly about 1,200 um, being approved. Um, the figures given out in 2020, generally this year. Um, the process, basically, if you look at the investment amount and process for Malta individual in investor program, they're looking at the um, uh, donation, which is a 650,000 euro uh, for the single applicant, and then um, the um, the 150,000 uh, investment could be on bonds and investment in Malta. The investment has to be hold for five years. They will have to establish the um, residency by 
um, either is renting a properties in Malta or purchase a, a, a property in Malta. With the minimum amount of, if it's a rental, it's like 16,000 euro a year. If purchased, 350,000 euro a year. Uh, 350,000 uh, property as a minimum investment amount. And of course, they, they all need to have a uh, insurance policy cover Malta. Um, that's Malta. Uh, of course, the, um, it goes through two stages. The clients will need to um, apply to uh, Malta uh, for the, at the residence uh, stage where the Malta will give out the residence card, which is allow them to travel within the Schengen because Malta is also a Schengen uh, member state. And then throughout the citizenship program, which is the government, we will conduct the four tiers due diligence um, process. They basically look at the, um, first of all, uh, they identify if the, the uh, verification of the applicants and then the, the source of fund, um, the, the legit, if the wealth and then the source of the fund is coming from a legitimate source. Um, that's the four tiers um, due, diligence, due diligence checks the mountain has. And then after that, of course, then if the, once the government granted the approval, then the client will, will com, uh, complete the investment, then they will send out the invitation to invite the applicant for the um, oath. Um, that's Malta currently, the processing time is roughly about 15 to 18 months, um, depends on, on the cases. Um, um, if you look at Cyprus, Cyprus um, uh, is different types of investment. Um, basically, they are looking at the two million euro investment on the property, and then, or maybe the, the funds or the um, setting of a company. Uh, uh, the popular options, a lot of clients now actually um, doing investment on the properties, and then they'll have a donate uh, 150,000 to, um, uh, to the government. The investment of the property will need to be whole five years. Um, the processing time relatively uh, will say faster than Malta currently runs about nine, 12 to 12 months. And so they will have to invest first and then they will grant the approval. And then also the same thing, they will have to go to, to Cyber twice. And then once the, the approval is granted, they will need to go to the country to take the over for regions. So if you look at uh, these two programs, actually um, the both country enjoys the financial benefits from the investors. And then um, I think, um, if uh, you look at the, uh, which is the question here, the AML due diligence process, like mentioned previously, that if you look at the Cyprus, the Cyprus actually has a direct cross reference of AML in their legal framework already. So, and then the, the banks actually um, has a compliance that you have to check on the funds, the verifies the funds, the source of fund with the proof and also have to submit it to the government. Of course, they look at the criminal records, the search in the Europol and Interpol, and then this are the process that Cyprus look at the due diligence process. If you look at the Malta, basically I, I mentioned earlier, there are four tiers due diligence checks. They're covering the KYC, the police clearance, uh, the source of fund, and how the clients, applicants accumulate their wealth. And then of course they will have to um, disclose the business and corporate affiliation. Um, and then and then all the, um, also they will look at uh, the, the, the applicant, whether they're a political exposed person. Those are all the um, due diligence process that the government actually is imposed for both countries. Currently, these two options are, are very, um, I would say the popular options uh, in, um, in the U European EU uh, countries right now for the uh, high net worth families. Um, however, um, Michael, if you could okay. do me a favor to flip to the next page. Yes, and I, no thank you. So the, this is a, a slide that will actually um, mention about the leading resident citizenship programs, because a lot of time for high net worth families or ultra high net worth families, I think we always ask the client, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of you getting a residency or citizenship programs? A lot of uh, ultra high net, worth, high net worth clients, they also look at for CRS planning, tax planning in their perspectives. So um, we always have to mention, I think also to remind the clients, what's the commitment you want? Because a lot of, if you look at the, the case study in the past, I mean, in this uh, uh, VRLT today, they, they, a lot of them has a business in China, for example, and they, they are a business kingdom or enterprises in China. So a lot of time, they, they can fulfill the physical residence 
uh, requirements. So they can move, uh, relocate. Maybe some of the family we see, they, they probably uh, have the wife and children live in Canada previously or the US. And then the husband, which the breadwinner usually have another citizenship or, or, or actually domicile in, in Hong Kong, Singapore, or having the Chinese nationalities. With the current uh, uh, trends that we see now, actually, because if you look at this pages, that there are many programs available. Like uh, the newest one is Montenegro, which is uh, started accepted uh, uh, application last year. Um, and then um, we have a popular uh, options also coming from Caribbeans. Really depends on the needs. For example, a lot of clients that we see in the region, for example, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, in the early days where they already obtained the US citizens, if they need to renounce the, the citizenship, they would probably, uh, depends on the timeline, if they have very short, they have a shorter timeline, they probably would go, uh, go for the uh, Caribbean options, which takes only four to six months maximum application time. And the investment is roughly about 100,000 US dollar to uh, maybe currently 250,000 US dollar. So it's a faster processing time, uh, straightforward, and then there's no physical residence requirement. For that kind of purposes, they would probably go for Caribbean. So that currently we see this Caribbean option is also an interim solutions because residence and citizenship planning nowadays for the high net worth families is something I would say quite important because changing of the citizenship or changing the residency basically do have some impacts in terms of succession planning, wealth planning, even in the trust structures. So choosing the right one, firstly, they look at the legal basis, the global mobility, the taxation background of the countries, the timeline, and also the economic stability uh, of the, uh, the, the, the purposes we have to look in. And of course, the timeline I mentioned earlier. So Caribbean, we see actually are the interim solution. We see a lot of clients actually doing um, on the same time with the Caribbean option as interim, and they also apply Cypress and Malta as uh, the long run, because like I mentioned earlier, both countries, the member of the EU, uh, they allow the freedom of that establishment within the 27 countries to offer the visa fee global to 180 or 170 countries. So the global mobility also gives them the freedom to travel within the whole, I mean, for the business, um, maybe purposes for other purposes. And the tax uh, background of these two countries are also quite uh, beneficial. Um, so I think um, besides the citizenship, we always advise clients also to look into the residence because when you mentioned about domicile, um, a lot of uh, our clients will also look at where's your tax domicile residency. So a lot of clients are platform, they also have, they choose the Hong Kong or, or Singapore as their tax domicile. Um, so which is, I think, um, which all the gentlemen has mentioned, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore has a very good um, attractive taxation uh, schemes that attract uh, a lot of high worth coming into both jurisdictions on that. So I think, Choosing residence and citizenship program really depends on the needs of the clients and what are the commitments they can commit into it. Of course, that also have to look at the um, application process from the government side and then the, um, the DD due diligence nowadays with the transparency, um, with the banking and, and the financial industry and the world. I think we, we really need to be really um, upfront to explain how you accumulate your wealth, Where's the source of fund? This is what the government is looking at. So I think this uh, will conclude my uh, a very short uh, brief and summary of my presentation. Thank Thanks you. very much, Jennifer. And um, there were very, very good points. And uh, I quite agree that there are a lot of uh, areas where there's overlapping, because even from a trust perspective, um, tax is always an issue, and also uh, domicile and uh, residency is also a very important issue. So. Quite often when we're planning uh, trust for clients, we also ask them, do they have any plans to immigrate to any particular countries? Because that will determine uh, the parameters of our trust planning as well too. So uh, I agree, there's a lot of overlap in all these different areas. And also, um, you know, what, what uh, Dr. Gong and John and, and Zach talked about as well. Um, very much a lot of overlap in all the various different areas. So anyway, I think we are well run over our time. Um, so we'll move on to uh, Q and A. Um, and I'm not sure whether we actually have time to um, answer all of the questions 
or any of the questions today. There's a um, quick one there, Michael. Is a post-nuptial agreement possible prior to setup of a trust? I think right, this would probably be um, in respect of both the US or the, or the uh, from a China perspective. Um, certainly from, from the, the trust perspective, um, we talked about the protections or the lack of and the way that the laws would interact. But um, as, a, as a bland comment, I think, yes, you probably could um, uh, set up a post-nuptial agreement prior to set up a trust. But I think if this is getting at the trust being attacked on a community basis, um, you would probably be, do well to also look at a consent to the transfer. I think that's correct, isn't it, John and, and Frank? If you get a consent to the transfer, then the community um, is being taken care of by, at that point. Is that right? Yeah, agreed. You would want the pre or post nuptial agreement to have envisioned the trust or have in a best case scenario made specific reference to it prior. But absent that, um, you definitely would want to have consent and awareness. Now the the super, it's a superseding act. And so it can be construed as um, uh, counter to what was agreed previously, but that would have to be both parties agreeing to that. So yeah, you'd want that consent in writing. Yes. That, that's a very good point, Zach, and um, and, and uh, perhaps Frank may like to comment on this. Um, uh, yeah, as a matter of practice, as trustee, um, uh, what we commonly do with um, Chinese clients um, who have been uh, married in China or are married where we have either just a single husband or wife settling assets into a trust during their marriage, um, we always try to ask them to obtain the um, other spouse's consent um, to the uh, client or the set law settling uh, effectively uh, joint community property into a trust. Um, and on the basis that you know, they, if they do get divorced, they will not challenge the trust and try to claw assets back out. Now, I understand that's not, not always possible, um, but where possible, we do try to cover that uh, with a uh, spousal consent letter of some sort. There's also another question, which is um, looks like from from the outside that the Chinese based forced airship rules are more a sort of like a, a, what we would see in a common law jurisdiction as a family dependent claim. So to the traditional forced air rules under, let's say, continental Europe would assign percentages to the spouse percentages to the surviving children. But under the China system, there's no percentage allocation. There's only this reserve in respect of dependence, which um, the question asked here is, uh, can we clarify that actually there is no percentage um, shares? What there is is effectively a, a, a reserve on a discretionary basis for dependence to be decided by the, uh, the, the court. Is that correct then, Frank? It's basically. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay. We've got uh, an interesting one. Final one, I think, is um, let's see, we've got one on the chat. So, one's quite wide. What are the differences of trust between Hong Kong and Singapore, especially in regards to tax considerations and protection of assets? I think that's probably a good one for, for um, sort of to be answered offline because it's a fairly pervasive question. So, I think that's better for offline. There's one here dealing with um, if A is a Singapore domicile and B is a China domicile. So we've got couples here with different domiciles and they marry in the event of death, divorce, B is subject to community property. Um, law says she is Chinese and A is a spouse regardless of domicile of A. And A is her spouse regardless of domicile of A. So A can claim, would this be correct? Conversely, B has no community property claim against A since A is not subject to it. Okay, I think the basic point here is you won't bring to the marriage different communities. What will happen is the, the, the governing law will have to figure out what your central community is. And uh, common law jurisdictions have struggled quite heavily with doing this. So they, they ended up saying in, in, in olden times, it would be the husband's domicile because in the olden times, a wife had a domicile of dependency on the husband. Now that's changed from the seventies in the UK. It's also changed with respect to uh, Hong Kong, Singapore. So you would, what would happen is the law would have to struggle to find a commonality. And that's generally the first place where the first matrimonial domicile, so where they collectively live, but it would be open to interpretation. So you don't bring separate communities to a marriage, you bring one central community. And the challenge for the jurisdiction is to find where that central community is. 
And it's usually where the couple then effectively settle together in their first matrimonial home. Is that broadly how it is for, for you, Frank, from a China perspective and John from a US perspective? Yeah, so for China, uh, number one is both uh, the common domicile, if they can. Number one is whether they, they have agreement for uh, to choose a particular governing law, but usually they don't agree to anything. So uh, then number one is common domicile. Uh, if there's no common domicile, number two, uh, common nationality. Uh, if there's no such common nationality, and then uh, it will be uh, the, the court uh, uh, entertaining the jurisdiction, which is PRC court here. Uh, so the PRC court then will also apply uh, the PRC law, uh, which will apply to the adjudication of uh, community uh, property. Right, right. And I agree, I agree with your assessment as far as trying to determine if we're trying to get to where the governing um, law would be. One thing I would add from a U.S. perspective, and I don't know if this would apply in, in Singapore, but if you substituted U.S. in that example there, keep in mind that the, that the law, the community property definitions are both um, for you and for your relationship. And so the U.S. would not prevent the non-U.S. spouse from coming to the U.S. and attempting to enforce the U.S. rules. So in that example where there was a stark, you know, this spouse can't try to enforce the other ones because they're not a resident or national of that, that wouldn't that wouldn't be the case from a U.S. perspective. You could you could get into you would have an argument to get into the U.S. system from both sides of that of that transaction. Right. And finally, well, I guess for Jennifer, just before we, we finish up, um, typically, what's the what's the process? Do you get involved in renunciation of Chinese passport or citizenships? Do, does that something that you would get involved with typically, as part of your your planning? and your, your investment migration sort of programs. So a couple come to you and they want to renounce citizenship at the same time as acquiring a new citizenship. Is that something that you would also deal with or would it be legal counsel that would help with that? So we, of course, Henley and Partner, we are very focused on the residence and citizenship planning. So basically we assist the client to obtain the citizenship and residency. However, of course, that when we have a situation like this, we usually have to refer to U.S. lawyers, of course, and then also the tax accountants or the tax advisors to settle all the U.S. related issues and questions before they, they come to us. But however, a lot of our clients, if specifically those one who already um, planned on renunciation of the U.S. citizenship, they would definitely need to get a uh, alternative citizenship beforehand. So that's why we would get help them to get that part and working together with the U.S. lawyers and the tax advisor on working on the timeline of their renunciation. Right. I don't, um, Frank, I don't know if you're, you're able to answer this one, but from a Chinese perspective, renouncing a Chinese citizenship does that give rise to a whole bunch of tax consequences going forward, or how how does that typically um, sort of dealt with if you're if you're aware? Yeah, uh, under the new amended PRC um, individual income law, uh, income tax law, um, when you are trying to uh, uh, renounce your PRC citizenship. Uh, there will be a tax clearance or tax audit, for you, uh, so to speak, uh, but it, there will be no exit tax. So they just want to make sure when you are leaving the country, uh, you, you, you are not leaving behind tax obligations. So right. it's different from what the uh, U.S. Uh, would otherwise do. Right, okay. Okay, I think we're pretty much out of time there. So I think, Michael, if you want to sign yeah. us off, Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, and uh, if there are any further questions um, that you may think of after this session, uh, please feel free to contact you know, any of the speakers, any of the panelists, and I'm sure they will try to answer your questions if possible. So uh, thanks very much, everyone, for joining. And um, uh, we look forward to you joining uh, further sessions of the virtual roundtable. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.